Well, welcome. Today we're going to be covering the Guide to Computer Forensics Investigations. This is the sixth edition. The material all comes from Cengage. They own and control all copyright material. I am just providing video lectures on the individual chapters for my courses using this textbook. My name is Arthur Salman, and I'm going to be working with you throughout this book. Thank you. Chapter 12 is all about mobile device forensics and the Internet of Anything. Again, this is a lecture review. All of the hands-on applied type labs are being done in separate videos. So the objective of this chapter is explain the basic concepts of mobile forensics. Describe the procedures for acquiring data off of a mobile device and summarize challenges of acquisition of both mobile devices and internet of anything based or type devices. So the first thing we need to do is we need to understand what's a mobile device. Typically we think tablet or mobile phone and both of those work for this definition because people store a wealth or a mass amount of information on their mobile devices, tablets and cell phones. People don't think about securing those devices. Items that are stored typically on these mobile devices, calls, call logs, SMS or multimedia messages, email accounts, bank accounts, any type of instant messaging, logs that are not SMS, web content, all the web browsers, pictures, videos, music, as well as all other app data from other third-party apps, or even just native apps on that device. All of those are classified as data on a mobile device. It can also include things like the calendar, GPS data, voice recordings, voice mails, access to smart device uh, devices. Again, there's so many uh, portions. There's even social media access from your mobile devices. Most of the time, depending on the generation, your mobile device could also be your key to your entire digital life or your digital footprint, depending on, again, uh, age and generation that you're attached to. So your mobile device has a lot of things. While search warrants are necessary to examine mobile devices, that's predominantly because they have so much data. In a private sector where your job provides your mobile device, again, that's going to be part of the documentation that general counsel will provide you. Some employers have a uh, paperwork that the employee does sign saying that the employee understands that that asset belongs to the company and so does all information on the device, thus granting the right to the employer to search that mobile device at any given time. But it really goes back to what policies and procedures are already in place. With all this included, Investigating mobile devices is a very ch big challenge. There is no single standard that exists for where stores uh, where phones store data. There is no specific standard how certain devices store anything. Not just that, there's also the attached cloud storage that are on a lot of mobile devices. So the data itself may not even reside on the mobile device. It may actually be downloaded off of a third party. So this all adds to the complexity of mobile devices. New phones come out every few months and they rarely are compatible with previous models. They might have similar structures, but that doesn't necessarily mean that the overall uh, data structure of the devices are going to be the same. So again, that those are challenges as we move forward. So let's talk about basics. First of all, signaling. Mobile device technology advances fairly quickly. By the end of 2008, we had uh, basically three generations of phone. We had analog, we had uh, personal digital communication services, and 3G. 4G was in 2009, and now we have uh, LTE after that, and then we have our fifth generation or fifth G cellular network that will uh, has been expanding and growing since the early 2000s. So these outline just the signaling portion of our technology. Another way to look at our signaling 
is how does it interface with the rest of the carrier? We have more, uh, more likely the Code Division Multi-Access or CDMA network, and that conforms to the IS95 standard. These systems basically outline how the mobile device connects to the cellular network. We also have a traditional global system for mobile communication, GSM, and that uses a time division multi-access technique. These are the two main avenues for mobile devices. So let's put this in the context. One of the major distinctions between GSM and CDMA is that the former allows you to make voice calls and transmit data at the same time, where the latter does not. But there are catches to both of these. The big thing is both uh, GSM and CDMA used to be tied to the specific carrier. But right now, after we got 4G, LTE, and 5G, there are no real technological differences between the two types of carriers. And more in the age of, again, modern day 4G, LTE, and 5G, the big thing is cultural differences, not so much technology-based differences. What I mean by cultural differences? Well, both of these, both GSM and CDMA, are used in different parts of the world. GSM is the most widely used around the globe, with about 200 plus countries using it. However, in the US, CDMA is the most widely used. So it really just depends on the area and the country, and that dictates which technology you're going to be using. Why did I say cultural differences? Because in some cultures, their wireless technology is based off of their understanding of technology that is best in that area. And in the US, we just kind of happen to do our own thing regardless of what the rest of the world is doing. So that's what I meant by more of the cultural component. So we kept saying things like 4G, LTE, and 5G. What about older technologies, 1, 2, and 3? So 3G was developed by the International Communications Union, ITU. And there's also the Edge network that was also developed specifically for 3G. Most of these have gone away. Most carriers have disabled their 1, 2, and 3G based networks because 4G is out of date. LTE is on the way out. 5G and 5G in R are taking over their places. Uh, 5G in R is the global standard for 5G. 5G is still, you know, a baby and it's still growing, but there are definitely steps in place so that 5G replaces most other areas. So what about 4G? 4G will use the following technologies. It does use the uh, OS DM, Frequency Division Multiplexing. It does work with mobile WiMAX. It does also have an ultra mobile broadband and MIMO. And most 4G also has the ability to do long-term evolution or LTE-based traffic. That's not saying that all 4G is capable, but most. Main components used for communication are the base transceiver station, the base station controller, and the mobile switching center. These are individual components that are used for our communication on the devices themselves. Interesting part is mobile devices can range from, again, tablets, smartphones, smartwatches, wearable technology, and more. The hardware components are typically the same as you'd find with a, a regular compute device. Mobile processor, RAM, read-only version of RAM, ROM, a digital uh, signaling processor, maybe a some form of radio module or frequency module, a microphone, speaker, some type of interface, and a display. Those are the general hardware components. The software components are normally a proprietary operating system to run the hardware. The most basic phones have a proprietary operating system. Smartwatches have a proprietary operating system. Smart things have typically a proprietary operating system running on those devices. 
The hardware components also might have some form of EEPROM, electronically erasable programmable read-only memory. So it's a type of ROM, but it's erasable and programmable. This will allow service providers to reprogram phones without having physical access to the actual memory chips. The, or, uh, the operating system is normally stored in ROM, non-volatile, available even when the power, uh, phone loses power, is typically in a read-only area. We also have our tablets and PDAs, or personal digital assistants. Most of the PDAs have definitely been replaced by things like, I don't even want to say iPods, uh, iOS-based devices, smart devices, your phone, your, your tablet, because there is a personal assistant already built in, whether it's Alexa, whether it's Siri, whether it's some other brand, most PDAs have already been replaced by a newer technology. Their use uh, has shifted to more, to more specific markets, such as medical and or industrial PDAs for the assistants. There's also peripheral uh, components for PDAs, flashcards, media cards, and other storage cards, whether it be a compact flash memory card or an SD memory card. There's external storage for those mobile devices. I actually often see PDAs for warehouse management. However, I've, I've also seen in the last two years, iPhones with an add-on replacing the warehouse PDAs with a much more robust tool, the iPhone, with the warehouse management software built in. Those have quickly started replacing PDAs in terms of industrial use inside warehouses. Most mobile devices have what's known as a SIM card or a subscriber identifier module. This is mainly with the GSM based devices. This will consist of some form of microprocessor and memory. This refers to your mobile device as a mobile station and it will divide the station into two main categories the SIM card and the mobile equipment, ME. SIM cards come in three main sizes and it's very portable for information so that the SIM card are very uh, versatile. In reality, a lot more physical devices are going to what's called an eSIM or a virtual SIM. That way you do not need a SIM card to be moving from a device to device. Your uh, SIM card is what actually uh, identifies you on your network, your, your device specifically. The SIM card is necessary for the ME to work and serves additional purposes. Again, identifies the subscriber to the network, you to the carrier, stores service-related information about your device, and can be used to back up a certain amount of data from your device to that storage. And that's not also that's not necessarily always true because there are definitely some areas where a SIM card does not do backups of certain types of data. If you have an iPhone, for example, most of the time, unless you're directing it to the SIM card, it won't save it to the SIM card. It will save it to, by default, their storage, which is iCloud. Many phones now include an SD card for additional storage. And that is really dependent on your make and model of your device. I have an iPhone. There is no external storage. There are ways to add it in, but it's not a, an SD card. It's more of a flash drive through a lightning bolt. So some uh, phones do allow for external storage, but that's not always the case. Also keep in mind that every country has their own specific regulations as they relate to SIM cards and so does each carrier. So just because you have a SIM card from one carrier, that doesn't necessarily mean it's going to work with a different carrier. It also doesn't mean it's going to work in the out of the country. So when we're looking at how to acquire data from a mobile device, the main concern is what happens if the device loses power? There's a synchronization component to cloud services as well as remote wiping. If you have an attached Office 365 account or an Exchange account or a business account, 
oftentimes those services have a remote web feature. iPhones have a remote web feature. So mobile devices that are attached to a PC via a USB cable should be disconnected from the PC immediately because it can get a wipe notice. This will help prevent synchronization that might occur automatically that will overwrite data. This might also prevent the synchronization of a wipe command to wipe the device. And again, there's pros and cons for this because you removing the device might modify it, but if there's still a cellular signal, that might also modify it. So there's a lot of uh, issues with mobile devices. Depending on the warrant or the subpoena that you have, the time of the seizure might be the most relevant. So it synchronizing data before or after the seizure may not be a positive thing. Messages might be received on the mobile device after the seizure. And then from there, you'd have to look at are those allowed to be viewed. Isolating the device from incoming signals is one of the best options. Normally placing it in airplane mode or placing it within a Faraday bag or cage and or turning off the device. Turning off the device uh, it really depends on the level of encryption the device has, assuming the device has encryption. Some do, some don't. Again, it's not a hard and fast rule. So you have to be mindful of how you're acquiring the data off of those individual devices. The drawback of using the isolation option is the mobile device is put into a roaming mode. This will help accelerate the drainage of the battery. The SANS defer course does recommend if the device is on and unlocked, isolated from the network, disable the screen lock and remove the passcode. That way, yes, you are manipulating parts of the device, but all of that can be documented. And that way, when you're trying to use the device, not necessarily being locked out of the device. If the device is on and locked, what you can do is base off of the type of the device. Some devices allow you to bypass the lock if you have physical access, some don't. If the device is off, attempting a physical static acquisition and then turn the device on. And again, that's also subjective because some devices may not allow for an acquisition to take place with a device being turned off. So again, these are more just the general like process that you should take, not necessarily the rule that you're always going to apply. So that does mean the order of volatility would still apply, even though it's a different type of compute device. You want to check the memory. You do want to check the SIM card. You do want to check any removable or external memory card slots. And you do want to see if there's anything that you can collect through the network provider. Checking the network provider will require a search warrant or a subpoena. So this is definitely outside the private uh, option. This will have to be a public uh, through law enforcement. A new complication is also the backups that are stored in cloud or through the carrier or through a third party. And again, all of those are going to be on the public side of the house and will require both a search warrant or a subpoena, but working through law enforcement. What gets interesting is there's an additional layer of uh, issues when dealing with mobile devices. Because there is a rampant theft with mobile devices, service providers have also started using remote wiping uh, options for users to wipe their PII off of a stolen device. So memory storage on a mobile device is usually a combination of both volatile and non-volatile memory. And the file system of a SIM is very structured in nature. All of this means they can house data. So if the device is stolen, the threat actor could remove personal identifi identifiable information off of those devices. So again, there are multiple ways for a mobile device to be remotely wiped that are legitimates as part of natural functions built into the tools for use of those devices. So here's an example of the SIM file structure. We have our memory framework 
and then we have the different subsections of each directory as necessary. Information that can be retrieved falls into four main categories. Service related information, that's going to be any subscriber or SIM identifier. There's going to be a call data, that's going to be call logs, number of dialed, things like that. Message information or message logs, as well as location logs. And location logs are going to be more like the GPS coordinates and GPS information based off of uh, the location of the device. If power has been lost, either a pin code or other access code might be required to view the contents of the device. Oftentimes, mobile devices by default have a certain level of encryption that are automatically there. Android, uh, Apple, iPhone, both of them have heavy encryption on their mobile devices. It really just depends if the end user has opted to turn them on or not. Now keep in mind all of these are not real enforceable standards. They've been growing. The big thing is mobile forensics is still evolving. It's still developing. It's still an infant and it's still growing based off of lessons learned. The biggest challenge is dealing with the constant changing of devices. They change so frequently that setting standards has been very difficult. So understanding the procedures for working with the devices and the software is where you need to focus your time. The forensic software will help you identify the device, making sure you install the device tools correctly, and attaching the phone to your device that will have the software, and then you start the acquisition. Again, we have our SIM card readers. It's a combination of either hardware and software devices used to access the SIM card. Might be a hardware component that is fed into software. It really just depends on what you have. You will need a forensics lab equipped with the appropriate anti-static devices and anti-static procedures. General procedure is you remove the device of the, or the back of the device. You remove the battery, assuming you have the option to remove the battery. You remove the SIM card. You insert the SIM card into a card reader. You read the data off of it. There's a variety of SIM card readers that are available. Some are forensically sound, some are not, so you make sure you need to make sure you're using the correct type. You're going to document the entire process, and you're also going to be documenting the messages that haven't been read yet, because that's kind of crucial. Use the tool that takes pictures of each screen as you are doing your analysis. Mobile device forensics are things like the Mac lock or access data FTK imager. Both of these are great tools for capturing a disk image or a mobile device image. So what equipment do you need? Normally NIST outlines six types of forensics methodology. You can do a manual extraction, a logical extraction, a physical extraction, a hex dump, a chip off or micro read. Depending on how you're doing your acquisition will outline the tools necessary to do uh, those acquisitions. There are software suites out there that allow for mobile device forensics. We have a uh, data pilot and Bitpalm and Cellubrite UFED. That's one of the bigger ones. There's also a mobile uh, edit forensics tool using a, a write blocker. There are tons of software components out there that allow us to do our acquisition. It really depends on what your budget is. Software tools differ in the information that they display as well as the level of detail. Some tools are you get what you pay for. Some tools are overly expensive, but they provide you the visibility that you need. Some tools are designed to update files and not retrieve data. Some are set to retrieve data only. So it really depends on what tool you're using and why. Celebrate UFED is probably one of the most common, but 
It is also one of the most expensive. In general, tools are designed to edit information, although they are user friendly, they're not necessarily forensically sound, meaning they may not hold up in court, hence the only using software and tools and methodologies that have been proven to be forensically sound. So some of the tools, Celebrate is going to be one of the big ones, UFED, they have options for data extraction, the, the logical, the physical, the file system. They can also provide the simple connection, but it does need a USB write blocker. Here is an overview of the Android file system, looking at an internal browse of that device. Here is a uh, screenshot of the magnet tool used for, for gaining access to a device. So again, here we're selecting the evidence source as we start our mobile access capture. Many mobile uh, forensics tools are available. A lot of them, the decent ones, are not free. There are some free tools out there, but again, you get what you pay for, and you need to validate the tool. It's not necessarily good enough to have the tool, but you need to validate the tool is appropriate for what you're trying to accomplish. The methods and techniques for acquiring evidence changes as the market changes. Subscribers to user groups and professional organizations do stay abreast of what's going on. If you are doing digital forensics, you may want to join some digital forensics groups and professional organizations. You may want to read uh, journals about digital forensics. That way you can stay kept abreast of what's going on in the industry. So, so far we've talked about mobile devices, but there are more things out there than just mobile devices. There are what's called the forensics of internet of anything. VMware and BlackBerry developed the Type 2 hypervisor for mobile devices. Very useful for security and protecting PII, but it will add another level of complexity to our investigation for mobile devices. That basically separates information between business and personal. So you can have a BYOD practice, bring your own device, and you can separate the business component to the personal component on a mobile device. This does increase the complexity of the device, however. We also have the IoT, or Internet of Things, and this number of devices that connect to the Internet is higher than the amount of people. For example, I have two people at home, but I have over 100 IoT-based devices. Smart lights, smart switches, smart curtains, smart water detectors, smart sensors, and more. So as we grow, so does the internet of anything. The evolution of IoT and IOE and IOA is only growing. It's not going away. This is going to be a lifelong problem as it grows. With 5G, it's only getting worse. IOA includes cars, pets, livestock, homes, applications, and so much more. And it is more aligned with 5G technology or for connectivity. 5G device, uh, devices do also have things like the massive machine type communication, MMTC, the ultra reliable low latency communications or URLLC. There's also things such as our enhanced mobile broadband or EMDBB, all of these are categories for growth. These devices also introduce new challenges. People to people, people to device, to device to device, to device to cloud. All of these make it a lot more complicated to do your acquisition. Wearables will also pose new challenges, but that's outside the scope of this uh, chapter. Vehicle system forensics, drone forensics, medical wearable forensics, all of those are only growing and they're not going away. That is it for this chapter. We looked at summary or we looked at the first section of people, how our phones are there, what phones are being used. We looked at the different generations of devices, 
3, 4, and 5G. We looked at 5G standards. We looked at mobile devices uh, types, and we looked at the range of complexity of them. Again, smartphones, tablets, wearables, and more. We looked at how to do acquisitions. We looked at industrial PDAs and how they're being replaced by certain other devices, typically iPhones for warehouse management. We looked at acquisition for mobile devices, how isolation is both a pro and a con, depending on the context. We looked at the overall SIM card structure. We looked at mobile device security and kind of the cloud services that they're interconnecting with. And lastly, we looked at IoT, IOE, and IOA as they increased an additional level of complexity with our acquisition of our smart devices. Questions or concerns, please feel free to reach out. All right, now that we've wrapped up some of the material for this chapter, are there any questions? There's a lot of different material covered. So again, the key thing is as you're going through the material, whether it be the reading, whether it be the videos, ask questions, write questions down. The more that you can engage your brain in this material, the better you are at retaining the information. So again, questions, please feel free to, to reach out and we will go from there. Thank you and I look forward to working with you throughout the remainder of these modules.